Well, good morning. morning. I got it right this time. (laughs) It is a good morning. It's a time that we've set aside to uh, spend the weekend in fellowship and in the hearing of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to pray that his spirit is with us and that he will accept our worship and our praise. Uh, We had a wonderful session last night. Those of you who are with us, I hope that you're uh, thankful and still feasting upon that which uh, God has provided through our beloved brethren who have come to be with us. Let me go ahead and announce them now, just so you'll know. As you know, this, this weekend we have invited Elder Carl Staten from Little Flock Church in Rogers, Arkansas, and he'll be going first this morning, and then following him will be Elder Gary Harvey from Point Remove Church in Russellville, Arkansas. Uh, these are beloved brethren and friends of ours. You know, they've, they've been friends of this church for many, many years. It's such a joy to have them with us. I hope it's a time of refreshment for them as well as it is for us. Uh, but it, it's only going to be that way if the Lord will bless us. So I hope that you've been praying and will continue to pray that the Lord will bless these brethren as they take the time this morning. I would like to start off by opening scriptures uh, to the 55th Psalm. If you'd like to read along with me, please do. I'm going to read the entirety of the Psalm. It's not that long, but it is about 23 verses long. It's interesting. It's a Psalm of David, uh, and uh, it says, To the chief musician on Naganoth, Maskell. Now, what's interesting about those terms are, Naganoth, in one sense, is a stringed instrument. There's a certain tune or a certain type of, of music that was to accompany this song, but it also is called a song of defiance, a song of defiance. And that doesn't mean that David is being defiant before the Lord, and it doesn't really mean that he's being defiant before his enemies either in the sense of building himself up, but it is a song. What that means is it's a song where we stand courageously against the troubles that we're facing. That's really a best way to understand that, and it also says maskal, which is also a song of consolation. So this is a very complex psalm. The reason I'm taking a couple of minutes to to explain this to you is as we go through it, I want you to understand what David is going through, and David's going through a very hard time. Many scholars think that this may have been at a time when he was running for his life from his son Absalom. Everybody in Jerusalem had turned against him, okay? And if you have not gone through that, I trust that you will, that there are times when it just seems like Everything is going bad, and you just want to run away. (laughs) You ever feel like that? I did when I was five. I still do sometimes, okay? But the refuge that, that David takes is the refuge that we have that is in the Lord. So as we read this psalm, consider and think about what God inspired this man 3,000 years ago to read to us. Okay, so read along with me if you would. Psalm 55. Give ear to my prayer, O God. And hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they cast iniquity upon me and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pained within me. And the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. That's right. Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness, Selah which means let's just stop and think about that for a moment. Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. 
But it was thou a man mine equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. He had been betrayed by a friend, which is kind of foreshadowing of when the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed by a friend. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. Let de- uh, excuse me. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God. And the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. There were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old. Selah. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. But I will trust in thee. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Let's echo the prayer that David here gives. It's one of sorrow, but it's also one of defiance. That is standing and trusting upon God to deliver us. And it's a song of consolation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. That's better. That's better. (laughs) That's better. Uh, I hope the Lord will be pleased to uh, use the time with us while we're together uh, to honor His name first of all. And then that He would help me right at this time, and then Brother Gary Follerman, that we'd be able to look at the Word, and uh, you would understand, and our lives be changed. That's the, that's the objective, is that lives would be changed. This morning, I'd like to attempt to try to talk to you, if the Lord would be my helper and lead. Uh, trust that it'll be so, if you turn with me to Book of Nehemiah, to begin with. Book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. I'll read a couple of passages of Scripture there, and then I want to go after discussing that for just briefly. I want to go to the New Testament passage of Scripture and uh, uh, remain in that area to talk about the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Of the Lord. Now, as I said last night, if I had a a uh, title for the overarching thoughts of that I still have and want to follow this weekend, it would be texts in context. Uh, I want to know what the book actually says. Nehemiah chapter eight, verse nine. Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, that's good, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, interesting, drink the sweet, 
and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That is an intriguing statement. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I want to know what makes God happy. I want to Remind us, just in the way of beginning, be mindful of the time as best I can to not encroach upon Brother Gary or to tax your patience any more than I probably will. Uh, the setting of this text of Scripture is in a time of restoration. It's probably with the exception of the exodus from Egypt, probably one of the biggest events that is recorded for us in Old Testament scripture. And a vast majority of all of the other prophets and words of the scripture of Old Testament time are focused toward this particular time for the nation of Israel. It's fascinating. Israel is coming together again. Coming together again. They've been in a time and a season, more than just a year, uh, that they were not able to be together. In a time that they had been scattered to the winds of the world, actually into the nations of Babylon and under the rules of the Medes and the Persians and those in a, that oppressed them. They had spent 70 years. Now, we think it's been tough for 2020, and not being able to do what we want to do. They had spent 70 years being carried away into Babylonian captivity and literally in bondage and imprisonment restricted from their homelands, away from the places of their nativity where they had been born and been raised, where they grew up and everything of their past had been forced and blanked from them deliberately. But God in his mercy had brought this time to an end and had begun to stir the hearts. Imagine this. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and as the rivers of waters. He turneth it whithersoever he will. God had begun to work upon kings in foreign lands to return his people back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. And what they came home to find was ruin, rubble, trash, nothing more than just faint memories of what once was. They didn't come back to the old home place and find it in good repair. It was in desolation and ruin. And, and what was left of their ancestry and their family folk there were in a pitiful, pitiful circumstance and shape. Oh, man. And as they came back to this place, a great work was underway. And this particular man, Nehemiah, had been one who had been burdened with the thought of what needed to be done. And as he came back to this place and walked about, the, the, the text of this book tells us that he had went out by night. He didn't tell anybody what he had in his mind and in his heart. He went out and found a place, and the rubble was so bad. He said that the beast that was under him uh, didn't even have a place to walk. He had to tie his horse or his mule, or the Bible would say his ass. Uh, had to tie up what he was riding up in a place and get off and crawl over the rubble to be able to see. I excuse me if you must for just, just a moment because that vividly brings a memory to mind. Perhaps y'all remember a, a few years ago when a, a terrible storm came through the Joplin area. Uh, 
I'm telling you, it was incredible. And after that, too long after that, storms came through Birmingham, Alabama, and in other places on up east, and, and the ruin and the, uh, the, 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 the rubble was, was equal. My good wife, who's not with me, some of you have asked. I do have one. <laughs> but uh, she went up and uh, worked with some of the other church groups in the area of Joplin during that, that time after that in the cleanup and such and spent a couple of weeks up there working with them. She came home one evening and she says, you hadn't been yet. No, I hadn't. She said, you got to go. You got to go. She said, you got to see this. So we left one afternoon and I drove up there and she was with me and went into the area of Joplin and was driving around through the streets and came into the city limits. And I, and I was thinking, I'm just being honest, I, I was thinking, well, what's the big deal? I don't see anything. And as we continue a little further over towards the affected area, uh, as you might can imagine, uh, I began to see a shingle off of a house here and there and a, maybe a tree down here and everything. And I think, well, this is pretty bad, but it's still not that bad. And then we, we top the hill. Absolute ruin. Nothing but sticks and stubble and trees and what was left over of, of places and you could tell where houses used to be. I'm talking about, it reminded me of my boyhood days in school when we actually studied history. And, and I looked at the pictures of, of England and London uh, after the Blitzkrieg, the, the bombing of the German uh, uh, Air Force that came over and bombed, nothing but ruin. And as I drove on through the streets, we could see the there was the people that there were there were there were little kids playing ball in the streets, in the midst of all of the rubble and trash, and over in here occasionally just heartbreaking. You would see an old couple just kind of holding each other and looking at what once was their home. Nothing, and it was devastation to see the literal destruction. That in some point is what we might get a hint of what Nehemiah looked at when he looked at Jerusalem, the task before him. But I've got to say on the heels of that, when I stopped the truck and looked over Joplin, I, I didn't see Joplin. You, you said give it to him. I did. When I stopped and looked over Joplin, I didn't see Joplin. I didn't know these people. I saw the church. I saw God's people. I saw the old Baptist church. Rubble of what once was and the daunting task of rebuilding. And yet, the desire to build. And the words of Nehemiah, as he called the brethren together, you see the distress that we're in. You see it. I don't have to paint the picture for you. You can see it. You're honest with yourself. You know what I'm talking about. Now, let us rise up and build. And the amazing thing about these folks was, that's exactly what they did. For the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to work. Now, now, I know, I know, I'm, I'm being honest with you as well. I've been around for quite a while now, longer than I'd like to admit sometimes. But even the word work to an old Baptist is almost blasphemy. 
Because we don't want to hear works preached about, you know. We want to hear that sweet old story of grace. Well, I want you to understand that that sweet old story of grace speaks to us of responsibilities. These people were coming back to Jerusalem, rebuilding the walls, and God blessed them to do magnificent, unheard of, unprecedented accomplishments and things. The walls, literally, we're talking about, we ain't talking about a fence. But we may be good at building fences. We're not talking about fences. We're talking about a wall, monstrous wall around this city that was rebuilt from the rubble that it was in. Catch this. As families worked together all around the city, one by one by one, with a trial in one hand, with a that in one hand and a sword in another hand. They were ready to defend and they were ready to work and they worked by family group. People, brethren, this is getting big, brother. The restoration of the church and of God's people and of the kingdom in this world today, and it needs it, Lord, it needs it. Teach us, Lord, and help us to have a mind to work is will be and can be and only will be when families begin to come together and dedicate themselves to the rebuilding of the house of God more than their own. Hey, God, chapter one. These people were coming together and rebuilding, understanding that they were standing in the rubble that they were in because of the sins of their fathers in the past. The 70 years that they had spent in Babylon was because of their fathers, their predecessors, those that were before them that had not done everything right. In fact, with God's pleading to them for centuries, for hundreds of years telling them not to do this and not to do this and do this and do this, they had rejected it and rebelled and had turned against him over and over and over again till God said, enough. And God sent a foreign king. By the way, that is that ravenous bird from the east. If you want to know the context, the man that executeth my counsel, that was Nebuchadnezzar. Sent by God on his own people. And he carried them away. And in the midst of those 70 years, God sent a message to them up there. Oh, I'm going to get you out. Lord, we're sorry now. Come get us. Take us home. He said, he sent a message to them. I will. I will. In 70 years. In the meantime. In the meantime. You get married. You raise families, you plant you some gardens, you grow your crops, you be accountable, you be responsible, and you pray. What? You pray for the peace of the city that you're in, for only in that will there be peace. You pray for those pagan kings over you. You pray for those people that are in rule over you. You pray that you might lead a quiet and peaceful life. Because that's the only way you're going to have it. And in 70 years, I'll bring you out. Well, here they are. And they come home to rubble. But Nehemiah, begins to rebuild. And I noticed something about the attitude of this people now. God's got their attention. Can I get a witness? God knows how to get your attention. And yet, has he got any of y'all's attention before? He has mine. And I have to tell you that the majority of the times that he does, it's not the way I want him to. I'd a whole lot rather have him come sit down beside him, put, put his arm around him and say, now, Carl, I need to talk to you for just a minute. 
I'm hard-headed. Most of the time, he has to give me one of those uh, upside. I'm talking to you, boy. Uh, okay, Lord. What was that you said? Because he'd already said it. But he's not too much in the habit of repeating himself. He don't have to. I'm listening, though. These people come and they begin to build, and, but they've got a different attitude. In the first part of this eighth chapter, it's a marvelous chapter, and I'm not going to take the time, I'm really not, to, to get into all that, but uh, go read it. Go read it. Read the whole book. But this eighth chapter is marvelous. The people asked these men, asked Ezra and the priest, are y'all listening? Or do you need to salah again? Are y'all listening? These people asked the priests and the Levites to bring out the book of the law of God and read it to us. They were asking for the word of God. May I say, one asked me last night my opinion. Sister Becky, this view. Here's part of my opinion. If we ever begin to rebuild and restore even a portion of what God has blessed us with in the past that we still have the pattern of in our head to build again, we have the mind of Christ. If the Lord would bless us to begin to rebuild, one of the first things we're going to have to do is, is that God's word is more important to us than everything on Facebook. And your phones. And your computers. And you flat screens, and your other junk that you're reading. Do any of you ever even read books anymore? But it, And all of the other stuff that you look at and you listen to, God's word is going to have to take priority. Amen. And you're going to need to know more of what God says. Thus saith the Lord than thus saith the news media. Sorry, just telling you plain. I believe it. God's word needs to be that. And they asked for it. And these guys were ready to do it, this fellow Ezra. Go and read the book of Ezra. He's another outstanding fellow. Because this man had prepared his heart and spent his life studying. Uh, the heart of the wise studieth to answer. This man Ezra had done so. He had prepared himself to be able to teach the law and judgments and tell God's people. When the opportunity presented itself to be asked of what God's word says, this man was sitting on ready. He was prepared. Y'all know anybody like that? I mean, you don't have to dig at them much, man. You just poke at them just a little bit and they'll tell you far more than you ever wanted to know. I mean, it just comes out of them. They're apt to teach. That doesn't mean that they're capable of doing it. They just probably will if you give them a chance. They're adapted to it. And here they are. They've asked for the law and they bring it out. Here's another marvelous thing. Y'all ready for this one? <laughs> I bet you ain't. I bet you aren't. Excuse me. I shouldn't even said I bet. That's bad. Y'all will be going to the casino for more than just eating. Uh, they requested that the law be read to them. Only place in the book, by the way, that the word pulpit's even there. And it was built so that the man that was speaking would be up above this mass of people. And another, marvelous, another marvelous statement here. And all the people assembled themselves in the streets of Jerusalem before the water gate as one man. That's a statement that is not only in Old Testament, but New Testament. And the only time that the church moves in a positive way is when they are of one mind and one accord as one man. No divisions. Just mark, mark it down. And they came together, asked him for the word to be read to them. A place was prepared, so the man of God and all of those that were with him, they had 14 of them up there on the pulpit that day. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. Not just two. And, and, and they were all speaking. That's why I said, you're not ready for this. They had asked for this to be read to them. And when Ezra stood up and opened the scroll of God's word before the people, before men and women and all that could hear with the understanding, they was kids there. They was old enough to understand what they were hearing. Now mark it. There was 14 of them there speaking and it says that they all made the people to understand because after 70 years of captivity, this people's language had been corrupted. And it's interesting to me that the 14 men didn't bring out 14 different versions of the law. They brought out the original. Just one. But they made the people understand from the one. But they had to speak so that they could be understood. Y'all with me? Come on. And when he stood up and opened the scroll, all of the people stood up. You know why they did that? Because they respected the word of God. Y'all are still sitting. And they didn't just stand there for just eh, 10 minutes or so. They read from the morning to midday, half a day, these people stood in their place for a half a day and even more on over into the evening reading this. And as they heard what was said, they acknowledged what was being said. Here's scriptural precedence for saying amen, by the way. It's scriptural. When they heard and started to understand what was being said, of the law, of that that convicted them of their past and why they were in this circumstance. They had asked for it, and it was being told them, and they were acknowledging it, and these people were saying, by the way, again, men and women, young folks able to understand were acknowledging what was being read to them by saying, amen, amen, with the lifting up of the hand. And they bowed their heads towards the earth. Amen. So it is. And according to the text that we were read, it was having an effect on them. They saw their guilt. They acknowledged their crimes. They understood why they were in this perplexing and troubling and depressing situation and circumstance. And they were hearing the reasons why and it was breaking their hearts. And they were weeping before the word being read to them. By the way, and go on, the eighth verse is probably one of the best definitions of preaching there is in the whole book. They read from the book of the law distinctly, exactly, and gave the sense. They told them what it meant and made the people understand. They read it just like it was written. They gave the meaning interpretation of it from the book and illustrated it in such a way there was no doubt about what was being said. And the people got it. And it was tearing them up. And then our text. In the results of the weeping and the crying of the people acknowledging their sins, do y'all ever see very much of that anymore in church? I, I think it's kind of a sad day. We all want to smile. Cause, well, preacher, you're just going to tell us about the joy of the Lord, but now you're telling us you want us weeping and crying. Yes. I'll let the Lord handle that. But when they were weeping and crying and seeing the result of this, Ezra and these other men that were with him, began to tell them that this is a holy day to the Lord. 
Stop weeping. Stop crying. Neither be ye, I love this, neither be ye sorry. Quit wallowing around in here. Oh, so weak, so worthless. Yes, I know it now, and I've been told this, and I'm a sinner, and I'm a sinner, and this is all I'll ever be, and I know this too. My, my, all of them before me evidently messed up, and that's all I do is just mess it up, and, and I'm just... Oh, mercy, it's going to happen again. We'll never, we'll never build this. We'll never build this. Oh, you, you don't think they were like that? Oh, they dug through the rubble far enough to find the foundation of the temple where it once was, where the old house used to stand. And you know what the young people did? The young people, on fire and encouraged, ready to build and excited about it, when they found the foundation, hey, amen, we got a place to start over again. There's still a foundation. Brethren, the foundation of God still stands. Amen. Our young folks need to be encouraged. The foundation has not moved. We still have a sure foundation. The rock of the revelation of Jesus Christ still stands. Praise his name. And the young people were shouting with joy. And the old were standing around weeping because they remembered the former house and said, this one, even if we build it, will never be like that one was. You ever hear any of that? It'll never be like it once was. You know what you're doing when you do that? You're discouraging these young folks is fixing, that you're expecting to build it for you. But you're telling them, well, it'll never amount to anything. Quit doing that. Quit doing that. But the sound of their weeping and the sound of their shouts was, was so loud and, and together that you couldn't tell the difference from one from another. Well, it's time we start to figure this out. And these brethren says, don't weep. Don't be sorry. Quit your mourning. In fact, go home. Eat the fat. That's, that's an inc incredible statement. The fat is God's portion. Because God has said in his law, don't touch the fat, the fat's mine. Do you know the fat of an animal is the increase of the animal? That's the increase of it, the profit of it. God says, that's mine. You burn that. These are saying, go home and eat the fat. Oh, God is sharing with you his portion today. Eat the fat. Take the sweet. You're being given God's portion. God is opening up his table to you today. Go on. Eat. Rejoice. Be fed. And give to those that have nothing prepared for them. Share this. Don't go to the house and shut the door and hog it all up. Excuse me, my Mississippi comes out here once in a while. <laughs> Don't go home and be selfish. Stop singing that verse, Lord, keep us lowly and unknown, prized and loved of thee alone. Get that out of your book if it's there. Quit hiding out in there. I love what one little brother said years ago. I've told this. This is not original with me. I have never had original thought in my life. But it did, this little boy, his grandma was driving him through town, and there was an old Baptist church right on downtown, by the way, in Little Flock. We're the first Baptist church of Little Flock. We're right on Main Street. You can find us easy. Uh, we've been there before anybody else. But there was a, had a sign out there. I said, where it was? That little boy jumped up on the street. He said, Grandma, I wish you'd look at that. There's one of them old Baptist churches right out in the broad open daylight. Some of y'all don't get that. Some of them today are still in places you can't get there from here. And if you do, you probably won't get out. Saying, we need to quit hiding. Y'all are in a good location. Good location. I, I'm preaching to the choir. Okay. We ain't got one. Well, maybe you ought to have one. Anyway. Just kidding. Excuse me. And these brethren was preaching to him and telling them, this is a good day. Rejoice for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, what do you mean by that? I got about enough time to tell you, I hope. Luke chapter 15. 
Y'all ready to know what makes God happy? You, And when you understand it, it'll be what strengthens you? What they were telling them was that they were doing what made God happy. And that was where they would find their strength. Now look with me. Luke chapter 15. Real quickly, this is a fascinating chapter in the gospel of Luke. And I remind you who is being recorded here as he teaches, it's the Lord himself. This is Jesus teaching. And he gives three lessons, three lessons. Don't forget that. He gives three lessons with a common ground. He, he talks about, uh, because he's spending his time with the common people. And the Pharisees are murmuring and complaining. Now the common people heard him gladly. They were, they were glad that he was there and, and talked. But the, the Pharisees, the elite of religion of the day, was saying he's wasting his time with them people and he's corrupting himself because he's eating with them. He's doing what? He's eating with them. He's sharing a table with them. Okay. And he begins to teach. First thing he gives us is, is that he says there was a man with a hundred sheep. And one of them is lost. Goes off out in the wilderness. He's lost from the fold. And this shepherd goes out, leaves the others in the fold safe, and goes out, and finds the one that's lost, and brings it back. hundred sheep, one lost, one. Lost to the fold. I ain't got time to tell all this that I really want to, but just stay with me. The hundred sheep, one's lost to the fold in the wilderness. The shepherd himself goes out, finds this one, brings it back, calls and says, come rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost. Second lesson. He says there was a woman that had 10 coins in her house. 10 coins in her house. One of them got misplaced, fell through the cracks, whatever. But this one coin out of 10 was lost in the house. In the house. And she lit a candle, brought light into the darkness, and began to sweep the house and clean the house till she found, she didn't give up, till she found the one coin of 10 in the house. Y'all thinking? Y'all thinking? Woo-wee! See me at lunch. I'll tell you all the cliff notes. Uh, she searches the house for this one that is lost in the house. There was one lost from the fold. The shepherd went. This one's lost in the house. The lady of the house. Woo! The lady of the house is accountable for all ten. She doesn't let up till she finds the one in the house that is lost. And she says to her friends and neighbors, come rejoice with me for that that was lost is found. And, and then there's one man, one dad, one father that's got two sons. Two sons. Y'all read the account. One leaves the house of his father, and is lost. The other stays at home. The first one comes to himself in a hog pen and comes back to his house, saying he's not worthy. I've sinned. He got his priorities right now. I have sinned against heaven. And in your sight, Father, I'm not worthy even to be your son. Just make me one of the hired servants. I'm starving to death out here in the world. Just let me eat the bread at your table again. I'll take the crumbs. Oh, no. Oh, no. Servants? I've been watching for this boy every day since he left. And I've seen him a long way off this evening as he was coming. I recognized him. He smells a little funny, but we're going to fix that. 
you bring here the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, give him his privileges again. Put some shoes on that boy's feet and kill the fatted calf by the, the what? The fatted calf. That's the one that has been put up. I want you to know dad's been preparing for this day. This calf has been put up and been fed the best, fattening him up for when his son comes home. Kill the fat calf and let's rejoice. My son is bowed. Mm. I got one of them. Just tell you. And I'm still waiting. Older brother comes in and here, here's all what's going on. What's the deal? Dad comes out to him. He won't go in the house because he's sold up Mississippi, we used to say. He misput. He says, what's going on in there? They said, well, your brother's come home. Oh, no. Mm. He won't even go in the house. His father comes out to him. What's going on, son? He said, listen, I've been around here. Are you listening? I've been around here all these years. I've never left. I'm right where I've always been. I've never changed. I've never done anything different. I've been right here, kept things just like you wanted them in your house. But this here, look the way that it says, but this thy son, he won't even call him his brother. This thy son has returned after wasting everything that you give him. He's wasted everything that you give him, everything that he had. He's went off out there and lived it with harlots and, and spent it in a hog pen. And he comes back here and you welcome him back. You never gave me a kid that I can make merry with my friends. And Dad says, son, everything that I have is yours. You've been right here all the time. If you didn't use it, it's your own fault, son. It ain't mine. Because you've had everything you've ever needed to be happy all this time, and you haven't used it. Watch this. He says, and it's right. It's right. Now, this is going to trouble us Baptists, but there's things in there, too. But... He says, but it's right for us to be making, it's right for us to rejoice. For this, watch the way dad says this. He don't let up on him. This, thy brother, has come home. He was lost. Now he's found. He was dead, but he lives again. I think dad was telling him, uh, come on in the house, son. Enjoy some fat. A brother's come home. Dad's happy. Listen, all of these stories are about restoration and returning. All of these stories are about repentance. All of these stories have a common ground of result. Joy and rejoicing. And hear this verse, and I'm done. Get ready. In verse, what are I do in my glasses? There they are. Can't see them. <laughs> when the woman finds her coin, now he said about the nine sheep, there's more rejoicing over one that repenteth than ninety and nine that need no repentance. Well, don't be worried about trying to figure out telling me who them are, is and who's not. Just understand, he says, the joy is over the one that repents. But watch this, what he says. Verse 10. Likewise I say unto you, but when this woman, when this woman, let me just go ahead and tell you, when the church starts looking for those that are lost inside her own walls. You reckon there are any such thing? People that have fallen through the cracks in the church, in the dark. This woman lights a candle she don't burn the house down. 
She don't go out and ask for somebody to come in and help her. She acknowledges her responsibilities. And she lights a candle. She lifts up the candle and starts cleaning the house till she finds the one that was lost. And when she does, she's got reason to rejoice. She calls her neighbors and her, and her friends together, says, let's have a big gathering over here. And let's be happy because I found that it was lost. Come rejoice with me. And watch this. And the Lord says, likewise. Remember who's saying this. Remember who's saying this. This is the Lord. He says, likewise. I say unto you. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, friends, that doesn't say that there's joy in the angels, although I suppose they probably get the hint. But it says there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. Let me ask you a question. Who is it that the angels are in the presence of? Huh? God. Who is in the presence of the angels? God. And Jesus is telling this. He's telling us. He's telling you. He's telling them. Did I tell you that when one of mine repents, acknowledges their sins, comes home, is found in the church, out of the church, hog pen, out in the field, wherever they're at, when they come to themselves, return again, and the light finds them, and they're home again, I stand up in heaven and shout. I believe that. I believe that. Friends, I believe in one of God's children that's wayward has went away, and you know maybe you have been and maybe you are today. When one God's people, because of the influence of this world or the bewilderments of, of traditions or whatever it be, or, or depression because of the government or their own life, weighed down in their own sins and acknowledge it. When the Lord blesses them to come to themselves and remember the fat things of the Father's house, the sweet things of his table, and are willing to come home and say, just let me be a servant. I believe Jesus stands up in heaven every time and says, yes, amen. Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. Come, sit at my table, cover them feet, and dine at the king's table for the rest of thy day. God's joy is in the repentance of his children. Don't be weeping. Don't even be sorry about it. You share this with those that haven't had it prepared for them. In the acknowledgement of the law in your life, in your weeping and sorrow over your sins, God is shouting happy. It's time for us to be also sinners. Come home. great sermon we've just heard. Just fabulous. I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 4 if you want to turn there. It's always a quandary. I, I, I don't want you to forget what you've heard at all. But, uh, I surely don't. <clears throat> but I'd like to speak to you. Last night I talked to you about the fall of man, original sin. I mentioned original righteousness, the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, the first human being that ever actually lived a righteous life. 
Uh, by the way, he's the only one that ever did that. Not only the first one, he's the last one. Uh, you're, none of us are living righteous lives like we'd like to. You come on. I mean, you know. <sighs> Romans chapter 4. Uh, my subject this morning is the imputed righteousness of Christ. You drink out of the right one, Carl? <laughs> you didn't drink out of either one of them. How do you preach all that without drinking water? <laughs> yeah. Huh? The imputed righteousness of Christ. Um, okay. Uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. What saith Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. That, that's an incredible statement. Absolutely incredible. And all Abraham was doing was looking up the stars and believing what God told him. That, mean he, that means he believed what God said. And God gave him credit for a righteous act. Mercy. And it's not by acts of righteousness that we are born again, so that excludes that from getting you saved, right? Everybody understand that? I mean, goodness, okay. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. In other words, if you work, you earn it. Plain and simple. Now, if I, if I, if I give you a million dollars to walk up here to the pulpit, you've, you've earned that million dollars. you just well paid, right? Okay, enough of that. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Verse 6, 7, and 8. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Okay, so apparently there are some people that God imputes righteousness to them. And it's got to be, obviously, if he imputes righteousness to them, it's got to be somebody else's righteousness he imputes to them. Amen. I mean, ye. by the way, let me preface this by saying, theology is a science. Absolutely it is. And it takes, and there's a lot of facts in there, and it takes a lot of effort to get it all squared away to know what's what and to get it all figured out. It is not child's play. I've studied lots of things in my life. I've, I've enjoyed it. I'm an egg-headed, nerdy dude. Carl's asking who's reading books. I'm one of those people who still reads books. Anyway, I've studied you know physics and math and sci the sciences and literature and grammar and all these things, some complicated stuff, Nothing is more challenging, no more fascinating, no more rewarding than learning theology. It is a science. It is not, okay. So, there are some people unto whom God imputes righteousness without their works. What? Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So apparently the people whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered are those unto whom the Lord imputes righteousness without works. That is without works on their part. Let me tell you something. Salvation's free to you. Your eternal salvation is totally free to you. It is absolutely a free gift. You don't earn it. You don't do something for it. You're dead before you get it. But it cost Christ a lot. It's free to you. It cost him everything. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. and whose... Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not Impute sin. That's one of the mind blowers of all ages right there. 
You mean to tell me there are men and women and boys and girls all over the world, third world countries, all everywhere, out of every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and family, that God, by the way, this is a holy God who will not sweep sin under the rug. A holy God who's going to punish sin, who will not justify the ungodly. And he says, there are people <laughs> unto whom he will not impute sin. Well, that's, that's crazy. What? They're sinners. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. I promise you, you've sinned today. I promise. I mean, I don't know what. Uh, just the least little wicked thought dashing through your mind. Okay, Carl's preaching how we ought to pray for the president, and you're thinking, I wish some, someone would, I wish he would be in the nursing home. <laughs> or whatever. You know, did you, maybe, you ever think that, I think that kind of stuff. Wow. Blessed, are, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay. That's an incredible statement. Their iniquities are, okay. Now here's the way all this works, if I understand it. Oh, the imputed righteousness of Christ. Now I know about the doctrine of suretyship before the foundation of the world. I know that, y'all, you know, I know that God never, 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 never held the elect accountable to pay their sin debt. Never. From the foundation of the world, God had put all that on the shoulders of Christ. Amen. So, in other words, I, I don't know what you'd call it. As far as the legal record or whatever, their sin debt, huge as it was, was always on the account of Christ for Him to pay it. Always. They never were held accountable to pay it. Are you listening? Christ was always the one held accountable to pay it. One reason why is you can't pay it. <laughs> you don't have, I mean, you have no coin with which to pay it. Yeah, that's right. You don't have any, you know, the money that you, what, what you, it's no good in God's economy. I think about it. It was not, didn't Carl say, or one of us, I don't know, I think Carl said that, the, that every man at his very best is just altogether vanity. Okay. But there was a time when all that sin that had been put on Christ's account and that God had held Christ accountable or required it of him. Even, the scripture even calls Christ elect. I guess God chose him to do this work. I guess. You know? And, and so all, from, from before the foundation of the world, it was Christ's job. His, and, and not only his job. I don't want you to think that Christ was in heaven saying, oh man, us. No, Christ was glad to do it. And he knew what it would cost him. And he came gladly. It's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Okay. But y'all, there came a time when all that was imputed to Christ, not, not just put on his account. He was made guilty of it. Now, but there was, but there was something else that happened there, when, when that took place, and I learned, I, I learned the terminology here that I'm fixing to use from Dickie Haubgewalks, the genius of Oak Hill Church. <laughs> and that is the double imputation that took place in the atonement. I'm speaking to you about the imputed righteousness of Christ. And the result, the four results of it. Now I want you to think with me now. All right, I, I said to you last night, I say to you again, there's no doubt that God was holy. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, holy, never have been anything other than holy, never will be anything other than perfectly holy. But I'm talking about a human being, a man that was holy. Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written to me, a body hast thou prepared me. That body was prepared for Christ by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a Jewish virgin by the incarnation, the virgin birth. I hope you believe in that. Amen. Listen to me. If Jesus Christ had an earthly father, you're going to burn in hell, so is everybody else. Amen. And that's just the end of it. You don't have a savior. You don't have a redeemer. You don't have a days man. You don't have, see, there, there was a days man. Christ was the days man that could put his hand on God, knew everything about being God. Put his hand on man, knew everything about being a man. You have never been through anything remotely like or comparable to what Christ lived through. You can forget it. You say, boy, I mean, I, I mean, I've known people that it's woe is me all the time. Woe is me. Ain't nobody got problems like I got. I've heard people say, nobody knows what I go through. And I said, well, do you not have a Lord? And you think you're going through a lot, and we, and we do, but it's nothing compared to what Christ went through. Nothing. He was conceived in the womb of a Jewish virgin. He was conceived without original sin. Okay, that's why you need to understand original sin, because Jesus Christ was conceived, didn't have any of that. Just let that soak in. <laughs> Consequently, Christ didn't have a debt of his own. And since he didn't have a sin debt of his own, he could pay yours. I've got a sin debt. Eternity, I won't get the, wouldn't get the debt paid. And I certainly couldn't pay the sin debt for somebody else. If I'm going to pay the sin debt for somebody else, I can't have one of my own. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. All right, Jesus Christ was conceived in absolute sinlessness. He's the only baby that is ever born without sin. Every other baby born was born a sinner. And by the way, it doesn't take them long to sin. They sin before they're six months old. You say, you devil, to say such a thing. Well, you know, I think babies like to be held and cuddled. I'm speculating. The reason I uh, think I know that is because I like to be held and cuddled and I'm 61 years old. I've often said, I wish, I just wish I could, somebody would just support me and hold me and you know, wrap me up. And Wouldn't that be nice? Well, the first time a baby screams and pitches a fit when they're full and dry and clean and there's, there's nothing wrong with them, they're telling a lie. Now, that's very unpopular doctrine with mamas. But it's the truth. Do babies, can babies lie? What, what, you know what the Bible says about them? They come forth from the womb speaking lies. Argue with the Bible. Okay. Now, I say all that to say Jesus Christ never did that. I want you to think about the fact he was sinless. And not, uh, created sinless. Created is not the word I wanted there. Conceived in the womb, sinless because of the virgin birth. But then I want you to consider the fact that Jesus stayed sinless. All right, what am I talking to you about? The imputed righteousness of Christ, the human righteousness, the human righteousness that Jesus Christ lived before God to the satisfaction of the microscopic judgment of God about what is holy. See, we have even kid ourselves into thinking that we are holy. Okay, Jesus Christ was eventually two years old. This blows my mind. A little toddler Jesus. Do you, well, I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, okay, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, an infant, the creator of the universe in human form. By the way, you'll never understand that, how he could be God and man, but he has to be both or you don't have a day's man. Anyway, so here he is. He's a little bitty baby, never sins as a baby. 
He's two years old. Toddler Jesus. The imputed righteousness of Christ. Are you listening? Toddler Jesus. Never went through the terrible twos. I want that to soak in. John Harvey, who, by the way, was the one calling me in the middle of church last night. I've done bawled him out for that. And my phone's turned off. But anyway, John Harvey didn't go through the terrible twos. He waited until he was four to go through the terrible twos. Jesus never went through the terrible twos. Are you listening? Every time Mary and Joseph told him to do something, he did it in obedience the first time. He never disobeyed his parents. Never. The imputed righteousness of Christ. Not only did he never disobey his parents, Jesus Christ never, I mean, okay, so Joseph says, Jesus, take out the trash. You know what Jesus did? He took out the trash. And he did not. Are you listening? Jesus never said, ha. I don't want to, but I'll do it anyway. Are you listening? The imputed righteousness. I want you to understand what I'll, the righteousness that was imputed to you. Now your sin was imputed to Christ. The righteousness that was imputed to you was this righteousness that Jesus Christ, I don't know, stored up, treasured up, enacted, lived out every moment, every day of his life. Where else was there human righteousness to give you? Where could God get it? Where? And then Jesus, you know, 12 years old, he's in the temple. You know, you know, the story. And then, and then we lose track of Jesus, kind of like till he's 30 years old and he begins his public ministry. And that's when the heat, that's when the fires really get turned up. And Jesus Christ during his entire ministry, entire life, entire work, all that, and all the people hating him and doing all that they did to him, never sinned once. Amen. Not in thought, deed, leaving out what he should do, not doing what he ought to have done, none of that, not only so. You men know, and I've said, Becky used to, I used to, Becky's quit making biscuits. We buy some good biscuits, but I used to just try to bribe her to make me biscuits. And I would do something nice for Becky, which really it wasn't doing something nice for Becky because the reason I was doing it was to get her to make me biscuits. So that really kind of undercuts. If I'd have been doing it for Becky, I would have just been doing it for her and no strings attached. I would have said, boy, I would sure really like some of those homemade biscuits. Y'all with me? Jesus never did the right thing for an ulterior motive even. Are you with me? It is a righteousness, a human righteousness, lived out under the most difficult, painful, adverse circumstances imaginable. And yet, he always did that which pleased his father. Can amen. you say amen? Amen. Even as he is being crucified and butchered, he's thinking about the welfare of his mother. What would you have been thinking about? Jesus is asking questions on the cross so that we'll think about it for eternity. Well, for the rest of the creation, figure out what was going on while he was on the cross. Well, maybe eternity too, now that I think about it. Maybe we'll be learning in eternity. Y'all, the imputed righteousness of Christ. Okay, let me read you one more. It blows my mind. Before, before we leave Romans, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now there's 
the next thing I want to say about that is okay. If the Lord will not impute Carl, I'm going to pick on Carl. If the Lord will not impute Carl Staten's sins to Carl Staten, unto whom then does God impute them? Or unto whom did God impute the sins of Carl Staten? Because I promise you, the sins of Carl Staten are going to be dealt with as an elect person. Are you with me? And that applies to all God's elect people. Yes. So here are all God's elect people. They're every one of them sinners. They're conceived in sin. They're, they, they've received the fruit of the fall of Adam. Every single one of them are in that shape. They've got an infinite guilt. And the Lord says He will not impute their sin to them. So I submit the reason He says that He will not impute their sin to them is because He intended from before the foundation of the world to impute their sin to Christ. I don't know how God even loves us. We're so sorry and pathetic. Even, I mean it. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, the verse I want, that's, that's, that's not what I want. It's 2 Corinthians 5. Yes, it is. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5. Here's what I want. Verse 19 only. Now, down below, he talks about he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Okay, but I want you to look at verse 19. 2 Corinthians 5. G to wit. I'm just jumping right in the middle of this, okay? That God was in Christ. This is speaking of on the cross. We know according to Peter, he bare our sins in his own body on the tree. We know that. The death that Jesus Christ died on the cross is far more than yielding up the ghost. At the end of the scene. God was in Christ. By the way, where were all the elect at this time? In Christ. All right, when were they placed in Christ? Before the foundation of the world, they were in Christ. And by the way, to quote Harold Stoneball one more time, you were in Christ before you were in Adam. Amen. Amen. Glory. God had the answer before you even had a problem. Isn't that great? I'm crazy about that. All right? So God was in Christ. Do I understand that? I do not. But, you know, but I know that's where the elect were. They were in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world. That, by the way, is the world of John 3, 16, the world of God's elect, the world of the sheep, the world of those for whom Christ came to redeem. Okay, if Jesus Christ died for every person, every person is going to heaven. That's all there is to that. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. The war, he, so God is in Christ reconciling the world of the sheep, the elect, which is a world of people that was in Christ. In other words, Christ was working a federal or representative work on the cross. He represented others. God was in Christ reconciling the world of the elect or the sheep unto himself. This was taking place in Christ on the cross. That people out of every nation, kindred, tribe, tug, and family were in Christ. God was in Christ. Not imputing you still looking at verse 19? Not imputing their trespasses unto them. So here God is in Christ, and he is not imputing the trespasses of the world of the sheep unto the sheep. Unto whom is he imputing their trespasses? Unto Christ. As he says down below, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Y'all, God made Christ. Okay, let me pause right here. 
Do you think it possible that God is going to punish an innocent person? Is God ever going to punish an innocent, sinless person? I submit God could not in His holiness punish the sinless Christ until He had been made to be sin for us. Christ was made guilty. Now, I know it was on his account before the foundation of the world. Now, he is in reality made guilty of the sin of all of the sheep. Otherwise, God could not have punished him and remain a holy God. I'm not slandering God. Or you think, how amazing is that? That's Y'all, I'm going to tell you the transaction that took place on the cross of Calvary is the most astonishing, incredible, unfathomable transaction that has ever taken place in the history of the universe. Because not only was the sins of all of the elect imputed to Christ, I'm talking about God making him guilty of that. And by the way, who other than God can move guilt around anyway? We talk about moving money around, you know, transfer money to this count to that and move money around. God's moving guilt around. Now y'all look, I've got guilt that I still carry from the stupid stuff I did as a teenager. Any of you got any of that you're carrying around? You ever back talk your mama? Any of you back talk your mama? Back talk your daddy? Disobey? Maybe, maybe your mom and dad said take the trash out and I said do it yourself. And I still carry the burden of the guilt of that if I could move guilt around, I'd transfer that guilt to Brother Alan and let him carry that a while. <laughs> Alan, Alan, you carry that burden a while. I don't have the capacity to transfer guilt around. Only God has that capacity. Amen. God is now trans. He's transferred. <laughs> you got some of that of your own, huh? God is transferring the guilt of all the elect to Jesus Christ while he's hanging on the cross. And this is why he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he's buried under the wrath of God. That's a death. That's a separation from God that took place on the cross. When the sin of the sheep were imputed to Christ, at the same time, God is imputing that righteous, perfect, holy life to each of the sheep. That's the double transaction that's going on in the atonement of our Lord. So that you don't stand before God as a cipher. You don't stand before God as, as a moral neutral. That is with no guilt. You stand before God in the imputed righteousness of Christ. Amen. Are you with me? It's the most incredible, mind-boggling thing you'll ever contemplate in your whole life. It is enough. To, it is enough. This is enough. Your understanding of this, if you believe this and understand this and comprehend this, this is enough to cause you to burn and yearn and die to serve Christ the rest of your life. You don't have to have anything else to cause you to be moved and motivated to serve Christ. Other than this, it'll motivate you like nothing else to know you stand before God innocent of all the sin that you had, and you stand before God guilty, so to speak, of the righteous life of Christ. This is why you will one day stand before God in love, holy, and without blame. Now, four logical consequences of the imputed righteousness of Christ. All I have said to you so far is the introduction. <laughs> Let me compliment you. You're an amazing congregation. You're a good bunch to preach to. I thought about getting you to stand up and shake your jiggles, you know, shake yourself around, you know, and anyway, but you're, you're doing great. Four logical consequences of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Theology is a science. Theology is logical. Now, there are things in theology that we'll never comprehend. Like, you'll never comprehend how God can move guilt around. You'll never be able to comprehend how God can move righteousness around. Well, it takes God to do that. You know, God can do some things you and I can't do. Hallelujah. By the way, if you understand God, 
Any God that you can comprehend isn't God. Don't worship Him if you can understand Him. I mean it. God is incomprehensible. I, I insist the only way men know anything about God is God revealing Himself to us. And by the way, did you know it takes... Okay, y'all have mercy on me here. You know, pardon me, it takes, God, it takes God to reveal Himself to a lower order of life. It takes God to reveal Himself to a lower order of life. You do not have the capacity to reveal yourself to a lower order of life. We got robins that build a nest in our backyard every year. They, they, they make a gom on our downspout. And, uh, you know, their babies in, contribute to the gom on the, in the downspout. And they have babies. And that little mama robin sits up there, and Becky and I go out there, and we drink coffee and stuff on the deck, and that little mama robin flies off, and I say to the mama robin, Mama robin, you're in no danger. I will not harm you. You know what? She never gets the message. Because <laughs> I do not have the capacity to open a line of communication with a lower order of life. Only God can do that. Say amen, church. Amen. Oh, listen, and he's opened a line of communication to you. Oh, I love to think about it, don't you? If this is meaning something to you, you know why this is meaning something to you? Because you're a child of God right now. That, if, if you're loving this, if this, stands, if this is striking a chord with you, if you're understanding how your sins imputed to Christ, Christ's righteousness imputed to you, that's how you're going to be before God, holy without blame, form and love, if that, that you're a child of God. Listen, I'm not up here, are you listening? To get you to make a decision to be a child of God. I am hoping you'll make a decision to follow Christ closer every day of your life because I believe we're going to need it more in the future than we have in the past anyway. Come on now. All right. Four logical results of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Number one, no person Christ died for can possibly burn in hell. It cannot happen. It never will happen. Think about it. All of their sins were imputed to Christ. He bore the wrath of God for all those sins. God is satisfied with that atoning work. By the way, if God is satisfied with that atoning work, I make a motion we be satisfied with it. <laughs> You know, and uh, God is satisfied with that atoning work. God says they, they have no more guilt. Not only so, He has imputed the righteousness of Christ to them so that they are guilty of, so to speak, His righteous life. Amen. You don't have a sin debt anymore. You don't have a sin debt anymore. And you have a perfect righteousness that satisfies God. Pray tell how you're going to go to hell. It is absurd. This is what's wrong with the general atonement theory that says Christ died for everybody just to make it possible. Well, what happens to the atonement? If people that Christ died for go to hell, what happened to the atoning work of Christ? Did it disappear, vaporize? What's up with that? Theology is a great science. I am madly in love with it. Crazy about it. Because it honors God when it's rightly understood. Did not Christ say, I shall lose nothing? That's right. That's what he said. No person Christ died for can possibly go to hell. All right, number two. The imputed righteousness of Christ, properly understood, lays to rest all doubts about the eternal security of the believer. Amen. It just settles it, doesn't it? You see, we preach the eternal security of the believer. All right, I'm going to say something here. I love you. I love you. When I preach on these things, when I teach them in Bible study, are you listening? I never, never, never say... Uh, this is what primitive Baptists believe. You want to know why I never say that? Nobody gives a rip. I say, 
This is what the Bible teaches. This is what our Lord said. This is what it says in Romans, Ephesians. Don't take the power away from it by saying this is what... Now, I love you. And I'm never going to be... Y'all going to have to run me... Now, you're going to have to worse run me off. You're going to have to crucify me or get rid of me. I'm sticking around. You are stuck with me. Like it or not. <laughs> you're stuck, man. I'm not going anywhere else. Because you can't preach this anywhere else. I, I'm not trying to be mean. Okay. But look, let, let us... Let us come to grips with the fact that we do not believe this because it is primitive Baptist. We believe it because it is Bible. Amen. We have got to get that through our heads. Amen. Oh, the Word of God. Carl's right. We better get, the Word of God needs to be one of the most important things in your life. Right. I mean, absolutely. Church, the Word of God, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the most important hour of your week is the preaching hour. The most important hour of your week is when Randy or whoever is in this pulpit preaching to you the Word of God. It's more important than your prayer life, more important than singing, more important. It's the most important because that's when God is speaking to you through His through the called man through the inspired word. Are you with it? It's not child's play, it's not monkey business. Okay. The eternal security of the believer, mercy sakes. The eternal security of the believer should be forever settled. You see, this isn't something you agreed to do. This isn't something you accepted. God is the one that accepted us. Amen. Don't you wish everybody understood that? Okay. Number three. So, logical result number one, no person, the imputed righteousness of Christ, no person Christ died for can possibly go to hell. Any theological theory, any theological theory I don't, it doesn't matter, that says somebody Christ died for might go to hell because they don't do thus and so is erroneous according to the Word of God. And the second logical result is the eternal security of the believer is forever settled. Now, I know people don't want to believe in the eternal security of the believer, but most people that don't is because they believe they got to do something to get it. We're talking a transaction that is on a plane so far higher than anything you and I can comprehend that the idea of us rejecting that transaction is ridiculous. I'm not trying to be mean. Number three. Third result of the imputed righteousness of Christ is it forever also settles and removes the horror and the nightmare quality and the sting and all of the great white throne judgment. Now there's going to come a day when the entire human race stands before God. I'm absolutely convinced of it. I don't think I can believe anything of that if I believe the Bible. And he is going to separate his sheep, his sheep, Chosen before the foundation of the world, put in Christ before the foundation of the world, that were the very ones whose sins were imputed to Christ on the cross, the very ones to whom Christ's righteousness was imputed on the cross, he's going to separate those people from the goats. Based upon the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ only, alone. I promise you, when you stand before the great white, it's going to be the most glorious thing. You're not going to stand up there and the Lord put your sins on a balance over here and put your righteousness in a balance over here and say, so just see how you level out. Away with such theories. The Lord is not going to put all your life on the jumbotron so that you can watch what you did and hopefully we can see you. No, 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 no. You will stand before God on the great white throne, innocent of all sin, guilty of Christ's righteousness. Amen. That is that. It's not Nightmare on Elm Street. Or, uh, well, that's an old, I'm probably dating myself there. What's, I don't, well, I don't know. Zombie apocalypse. <laughs> it's not that either. 
It is going to be, I tell you, the great white throne judgment is when God is finally and lastly going to put the quietest to sin and evil, and the whole universe is going to be ordered just like God wants it. Won't that be wonderful? Amen. It's going to be just right. And finally and lastly, the fourth consequence of the imputed righteousness of Christ is it should forever remove any carnal ideas of levels in heaven. There, no, it can't be. You can't have levels in heaven. You know, like, uh, you know, I've worked harder than you. I've done more good works than you. I've, uh, you know, preached more sermons than you. I've traveled more miles than you. I've given more money than you. Therefore, I've got to have, I'm going to have a bigger mansion in heaven. I've heard that talk. The imputed righteousness of Christ removes that forever. This is why we're told in the scriptures that we're going to be joint heirs with, this is why this is in the Bible. Join heirs with Christ. Everything that is Christ's will be yours because you will have the same righteousness that he has when you get there. I thank you for your great attention.